The COD Zombies High Round community is the most toxic gaming community I have ever seen. From doxing, cheating, lying, harassment, and so much more, it never fails to impress me by its degeneracy. Unfortunately, it's always been like this. However, it wasn't until in the past few years it stooped to its lowest point. Now, before I mention any people in this video, please do not go out of your way to harass anyone. While some of the topics I mention in this video may cause anger, disgust, or some other emotional feeling, that does not give you the right to act immature. The point of this video is to expose the truth and state the facts of this community in a professional and mature manner. I do not condone nor support any witch hunt or harassment. And to reiterate, please do not harass anyone mentioned in the video. Suspicious Records On January 12th, 2022, Furrican Walk would post a tweet saying he got a new world record on the map called Ascension by reaching round 244. This was an incredible achievement as Furret had achieved a record two rounds higher than what was thought to be theoretically possible. However, some players were a bit skeptical of this game, one of them being a player named Oxygen for the win. Shortly after Furret's tweet, Oxygen would post an image of him calculating the probability of Furret's thunder gun luck, which was calculated to be 1.3%. This raised some questions as the Thunder Gun is the most important weapon on Ascension and allows players to push a map into the 200s. Burrett was quick to dismiss this probability, claiming that he played Ascension for 4 months straight and during those 4 months played 2,500 hours. Moreover, he would claim that he doesn't see players checking the probability of an old game he played on a different map called Nocturne Toten. He would then continue by showing the probability of that knocked game as a way to disprove Oxygen. Then, he would finally show his own statistics of his Ascension game, claiming that the probability of him getting those Thunder Gun trades was a 28% chance. However, that was with Teddy Bear box hits, which do not count as box hits since it's impossible to get a Thunder Gun or any weapon from the mystery box when you get a teddy bear. This prompted him to remove the teddy bear hits from his calculation, which resulted in a 10.7% chance of him achieving a thunder gun trade average in his game. This understandably removed any suspicion of his ascension game. At least, it was supposed to remove any suspicion. Nearly a year and a half later, me and another player named Mr. Waffler would rediscover Oxygen's and Furret's probability tweets. When we saw varying probabilities between the two, we decided to launch our own investigation. However, before we could investigate these games, we had to lay down a foundation. Because we were doing statistical probability, we had to make sure this investigation was as accurate as possible. This made us come to the conclusion that we would need to do a statistical analysis of the top three highest rounds that were achieved on Ascension. This was exceptionally important as these three rounds would be achieved by different players and would gather the most accurate results as they were all similar in length and were expected to have a similar amount of box hits and thunder gun trades compared to Furret. However, unlike Oxygen and Furret, we would track the traits of two other weapons named Gersh's and Dolls. Similar to the Thunder Gun, these equally had a big impact as a Gersh would kill zombies on any round and could give extremely useful drops, such as a max ammo. This drop would refill all the ammo in your weapons, such as a Thunder Gun, which could save you a significant amount of time, as you'd prevent yourself from doing a Thunder Gun trade. Moreover, Dolls were required to get more Gersh's if you did not get a max ammo. This is why tracking these three weapons were exceptionally important to finding a true and accurate probability of all these games. Although, there is one problem. On top of analyzing the three highest rounds, we'd have to analyze all of Ford's Ascension games that reached the reset. The reason for this is to increase accuracy. You see, in the three highest rounds each player hit the reset, similar could be said for Furret. He had three Ascension games that reached a reset. So, what is a reset, and why is it so important? 
Well, each map has a specific amount of playtime before the game resets a player back to round 1. On Ascension, that playtime is about 70 hours, and since each player resets at a similar time, this allowed us to gather good comparisons for Furret's 244 record, as well as his other two Ascension games that reached a reset. However, this proved to be insanely time consuming. After all, trying to analyze 6 high round games that lasted 70 hours and had thousands of box hits and trades could take months until they were fully analyzed. This caused us to add a few more players to the investigation, most notably being Zato, which helped us analyze some of these games and also helped with calculating the statistical probability of the games. Although a one player addition wasn't enough, because we really wanted to make sure our statistics were as accurate as possible, we eventually added two more players named Ace Red and II Dank II which specifically focused on the statistics of these games once they were fully analyzed. On top of that, I and Mr. Waffler would put our own effort into the investigation. Waffler would do an analysis of a few games and look for any discrepancies that could have been said by Furret or any of the players we were analyzing. As for me, I prioritized analyzing the games as well as helping out with the statistics collection. This quickly became the biggest investigation in Zombies history, and it wasn't long before we fully completed the analysis of these games. By tracking the trade average of the three weapons independently, as well as removing the teddy bear hits from the games, we were able to find the trade average probabilities by using the binomial distribution. This allowed us to multiply the probability of each weapon's trade average to find the percentage of such a game occurring. Keep in mind, insta round luck was not factored in. This is just reflecting the percentage luck of trades. Here is a graph showing the percentage and probability of the three highest rounds achieved on Ascension by different players. The game with the most average luck is Mercury's Round 234 game, which had a 36% chance of occurring, or a nearly 1 in 3 probability. As for Zomba's 233 game, it had a 1.4% chance of occurring, or a nearly 1 in 68 probability. A little lucky, but still very possible. As for Nestor's 233 game, his results were very similar to Zomba's. Nestor's game had a 1 in 67 probability of occurring. Once again, a little lucky, but still possible. So where does Furgut's 244 game land? Is it here? Maybe here? Nope. Furgut's game is all the way over here. So what's the chance of Furgut's Thunder Gun? Gersh, and Dahl trade average in his 244 game. Well, the percentage of these three trade averages combined is 0.000669%, or a 1 in 149,458 chance of such a game to occur. This begs the question, how much time restarting would it take to get this box luck? Mind you, this is only considering box luck, it does not factor the Insta's luck in this game, which wasn't perfect, but still great considering the bulk of his missed Insta rounds, 4 out of 7, were before round 200, meaning he only missed 3 Instas after 200. If he missed more Insta rounds than that, it would have required him to get more Thunder Guns and less box hits and get even luckier. In this case, his extremely good trade luck negated the downsides of his insta luck, which still wasn't that bad. This caused me to come up with the calculation to figure out just how long it would take to even have a 10% chance of getting just for its 244 trade luck. First, I did 149,458 times 0.10 to give me 14,945.8, which is 10% of the odds that would be required for such a game to occur. Then, I would multiply 14,945.8 times the total amount of box hits he got in his 244 game, which is 2,725. This would then give me 40,727,305 box hits, which is once again, the total amount of box hits he would need to do just to have a 10% chance of getting his 244 trade lock. 
Once I figured out this number, I would then try and find how long it would take to hit the mystery box, grab a weapon, and hit it again, which turned out to be 7 seconds. You could then multiply 7 by 40 million, 727,305, which gives us 285 million, 91,135 seconds. You can then divide this by 60 to get the minutes, which is about 4,751,519 minutes. You can then divide this by 60 again to get the total amount of hours, which is about 79,000. 192 hours. To find the amount of days, you can divide the amount of hours by 24, which gives us about 3,300 days. And once again, you can divide this by 365 to find the amount of years, which is 9. So, for Fora to have just a 10% chance of achieving his 244 trade lock, he would need to hit the mystery box non-stop for over nine years. What's interesting is Fura claimed to have played 2,500 hours of Ascension, and 2,500 hours is only 3.157% of the way to nine years. And to reiterate, nine years is the minimum amount of time required to only have a 10% chance of getting his 244 trade luck. If we want to be more realistic, a 50% chance of Fura achieving his 244 trade lock would require him to play 45.2 years. Once again, Fura claimed to have only played 2,500 hours to get this game, which is only 0.6314% of the way to 45.2 years, which is the minimum amount of time required to even have a 50% chance of getting his trade lock. Once again, this does not include the missed insta-kill round luck. However, there is just one problem with Furret's playtime. He claimed to have played 2,500 hours of Ascension in just 4 months, which is an incredible amount of playtime in such a short period. This made us wonder how important our count is for justifying games. Simply put, Everyone's playtime is skewed. It's unavoidable because Steam playtime means only Black Ops 1 was open. Playtime includes hours when the game was paused, hours when the player was strat testing, and time when the player isn't even loaded into a map. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but playtime is even less reliable. You see, there are many simple methods to idly fake playtime by using free online tools like Steam Achievement Manager and sites like FreeHourBoost.com. You can also trick Steam into thinking Black Ops 1 is a CMD command, so it says you're running the game, thus farming hours. The best way to prove your playtime is simply to stream. That way, viewers can know which round ranges of time was spent playing, and it would show how many hours went towards one achievement instead of saying something vague like Steam's overall playtime. Unfortunately, we'll never know these things as Furret rarely streamed any of these hours he claimed. Even if we were to assume every single one of those hours he played on Black Ops 1 were played attempting the Ascension 244, and he was just hitting the mystery box, that would be only 5.051% of the way to 45.2 years, which as you know, is the minimum amount of time required to have a 50% chance of getting his 244 trade luck. To put it bluntly, playtime is not a good way of legitimizing a game. So, we decided to look into the game some more, and that's when we realized the game had no audio. So, why is audio important? Well, having audio helps rule out the use of patches, splicing, and using save states through the game's config. This is what we publicly currently know on how to detect cheat methods through sound. So, if they don't have sound, it automatically raises suspicion of the game, especially if none of the rounds have sound. You see, depending on the patch a person uses or modifies, it can repeat sounds such as a door opening. This does not happen on the vanilla patch of the game. 
So it's super easy to detect if that person has audio discrepancies in their game. Because Furret had no audio and never streamed his game live, this made us even more suspicious. So is this the only high round game that has no audio? Nope, another player named Umesco tried passing off a 5 round 244 game as legitimate when it also did not have sound and was not streamed. Furthermore, Umesco's 244 wasn't approved because it was played on a patch, but without audio on the Ascension game, it's impossible to tell through sound cues if a patch was used. Where things get more complicated is patches can be configured to be completely stealth, and that's where discrete math and statistical analysis comes into play. This caused a random YouTube commenter named Kay Evans to ask why Fur had no audio in his game. Furret then replied, was listening to copyrighted songs and didn't want to struggle with YouTube's copyright system. On paper, this sounds like a completely fair point. If you play enough copyrighted music on your videos, it could be blocked in many different countries, making the footage completely unviewable. However, I had my doubts about Furret's answer, because this is one of the only records where he doesn't have audio. Moreover, it's been incredibly easy to separate music audio from game audio as late as 2019. Even if nothing nefarious is going on, it's still strange that Furret can attempt such great achievements and not care to legitimize them through having sound, streaming, etc. I decided to look through a discord where Furret is exceptionally active in. This discord is called Bad IRL RNG and is owned by Zamba, a well-known Ascension player. While looking through the discord, I managed to find a discussion back in 2022 between Furret and other members of the discord, talking about Umesco, which had no audio in his 5 game. This eventually caused Furret to bring up his Ascension game, which led to him saying this. In his own words, Furret said, I should have recorded the sound on Ascension. Furret went from not recording audio at all during his Ascension game to he had audio but was playing music, so he completely removed audio to avoid YouTube's copyright system. To add on top of that, back in 2019 and 2020, Furret would achieve two games on Ascension, one of them being round 232 and the other being round 240. Both of these games were significantly less luckier than his 244 game, but his 240 record was still luckier than the 3 Ascension games we analyzed. Moreover, Furret missed only 5 insta-kill rounds in his 240 game, one of which was on round 239, making round 240 possible. For whatever reason, Furret is consistently luckier than everyone else by a significant amount. Unfortunately, this isn't the end for Furret. In fact, this is just a start. Because Furret's 244 game was played off stream, had unbelievable luck, had no audio, and had varying answers as to why he had no audio, it caused me to dive deeper into the rabbit hole. Another record where players had some suspicions was Furret's round 222 moon game. So similar to Ascension, I analyzed the top 3 highest rounds with full gameplay. However, before I explain the statistical probability of these games, there's a few key weapons that you need to know about. First is the wave gun. The wave gun is similar to the thunder gun. It has the same ammo, kills the same amount of zombies, etc. This makes it the most important weapon on the map. Although, there are still two more that play a key component to getting high rounds. The second most important weapon is Gersh's. I already explained what they are, but on Moon they are significantly more important as you can make any drop into a max ammo by using the hacker device. Lastly, a weapon equally as important is the QED device. Similar to dolls, if you can't get any more max ammos and you need new Gersh's, you're required to get QEDs out of the mystery box. However, QEDs can kill zombies on any round, give you drops, give you a fifth perk, etc. 
The weapon is heavily based around RNG, but it is still one of the three key weapons to getting high rounds on Moon. Because these weapons are so important, we once again found the trade averages for all of them in each game before multiplying them to find the overall probability of getting those trade averages. The game with the most average luck was Slayer's 210 Moon game. This game had a 13.7% chance of occurring or a 1 in 7 probability. As for Gyro's 211 Moon game, the same can't be said. This game had a 0.527% chance of occurring, or a 1 in 189 probability. Very lucky, but still probable. However, there is one game where it raised some eyebrows, and that game is ZRFM's Round 208 Moon game, which had a 0.1033% chance of occurring, or a 1 in 967 probability. This is a little suspicious, however, it's still technically possible to achieve this luck. So where does Furret's 222 moon game land? Is it here? Or here? Nope. Once again, Furret's game is all the way over here. So how lucky was Furret's game? Well, the chance of him getting his wave gun, Gersh, and QED trade averages is 0.007067%, or a 1 in 14,150 chance. Once again, Fur is incredibly luckier than everyone else, so I checked to see if there were any discrepancies in his game. Unfortunately, I could not find many, but the main one surprised me the most and this discrepancy involves a program called Tim. Tim is a program created by Magic Benny and makes zombies a more enjoyable experience for players by giving them the option to have an in-game timer, an automatic trap timer, claymore counter, twitch integration, etc. Tim is an interesting subject. Many times now, a small group of players have tried to outright ban the tool, despite the community repeatedly voting for it in majority favor. And it just so happens, Furry is one of those players who want it banned and considers it illegitimate. Going as far as saying that no one can deny Tim makes your run tool assisted, and anyone who uses Tim does not have enough brain cells to push records, so much so that you are unable to think at all. Well, when I looked through Furret's 222 Moon game, I managed to find this. So, in Furret's own words, he unintentionally admitted his game was tool assisted and he did not use his brain at all to get the record. To add on top of that, back in December 2023, Furret would play a Moon game that got to round 218. This caused me to analyze this game, which turned out to be a 2.6% chance of occurring. This luck is obviously possible to achieve, but this begs a question. How come Furret is consistently getting games near 1%? or lower. This caused me to check his previous Moon World record, which is round 213, played back in 2018, to see what his statistical odds were. Although, there was one problem. Fur was missing rounds 1 through 92, the most crucial rounds of a record. What's interesting is this isn't the first time Fur has attempted to claim a record with sloppy gameplay standards. Throughout the years he's been playing zombies, Furret has consistently posted under players' accomplishments, claiming to have a faster time and saying he's quote unquote sorry for not posting it. But for some reason, he never posts gameplay of that time he claimed to have gotten. What's even more interesting is Furret has posted screenshots of him claiming to get a specific time on a map, but once again, never posts gameplay. And what's crazier is even as late as 2023, Furret still does this. To add on top of that, Furret has said he has plenty of speedruns he didn't submit and that he doesn't care to submit them. Again, to care about these achievements so much and put no effort into legitimizing them is suspicious. Unfortunately, Furret isn't the only person who does this. Saluya Sluya and Furret have both butted heads with just about everybody because of their tendency to claim records without footage. However, when Waffler looked at the Dury solo section of the info spreadsheet, he noticed something was a bit off. The data for the Wonderwolf trade shown next to Sluya's dog rounds actually belonged to a player named Fleur. This made Waffler curious about the reality of Sluya's trades. 
so we counted them on his own to find the odds. Even though 30 rounds of gameplay are missing from the 250, not all of those rounds were trade heavy, and Waffler thinks the 65% odds for the observable trades is probably accurate. However, this one curiosity led to another when he noticed there's a unique pattern to Salia's gameplay discrepancies. Salia tends to miss footage of rounds from 150 to the start of instas most often. This is the case for his Kino 235, missing rounds 1 through 163, which he promised to restream, as well as his Kino 240, which was missing rounds 152 through 165, including more and his Doris 250, which is missing 156 through 165, including more. Since Leo's games are played on stream, and always has audio, that makes him less suspicious and fur it. But since he exhibits a pattern of gameplay discrepancies, and can be seen claiming speedrun records without footage to this day, is odd because it is a clear lack of effort to legitimate the achievements he cares about. Waffler had to ask Sluya why Fleur's trades were in the info spreadsheet. In Waffler's own words, he asked, Is there any information on the trades of this game? I went to the Dury solo page from infos, and I saw Fleur's 246 trade information put next to your 250 games times by mistake. Sluya would then reply by saying, I didn't track them one by one, and that's why I put Fleur's trades for comparison, but my trade average was 20. That's all I tracked at the time. He would then further reiterate by saying, I just counted the box hits and the amount of trades during that game. Didn't write the amount, but my average was 20 as I said. The 20 average is really close to the number that Waffler observed, but keeping Fleur's trades there even after explaining they weren't his is inaccurate. Hell, this shouldn't even be on a spreadsheet called infos. If anything, it should be renamed as misinfos, because that's exactly what it is. Sulia didn't make it obvious on the sheet that the trades belong to Fleur. To add on top of that, the spreadsheet as a whole is filled with inaccuracies. For its trades on his 244 game includes teddy bear hits in his trade average. Moreover, it does not include fire sale hits, which do count as actual box hits. Moreover, the amount of box hits in his game is 2,725, not 2,650. The amount of thunder guns he got from trades was 143, not 140, and his thunder gun trade average was 16.55, not 18.84. Whether this information was intentional or not is up for debate, but there's no denying they have purposely misinformed community members about the stats of their games. Together, with all the other factors, this raises many questions about the legitimacy of their games. But the cheating problem isn't just mathematical, it's widespread within the community. Known Cheaters Firerim Firerim was a very interesting player. He effectively started out as a meme. Everyone would stop what they were doing when he went live to watch him rage and complain about RNG. This reputation earned him entire compilation films made in his name by a player named Bagsy. In the following years, he seemed to have pivoted to becoming a fast player, making for entertaining streams with the chance of world records occurring. And finally, he gained respect from high-status zombie players. However, on February 27th, 2022, Firerim would attempt to fake an ascension game by manipulating his RNG using a stealth patch. However, something unexpected happened. While holding a thunder gun and hitting the box to trade it out, he would get another thunder gun. The reason this proves he was cheating is because it's impossible to get a thunder gun from the box while holding one. This forced Firem to write up an apology on Twitter, saying how there was no excuse for him cheating and how he was sorry for what he did. Although, there was just one problem. Similar to all cheaters who come clean, he only admitted to this game being cheated. Going as far as saying this will never happen again, and it's the first time he demonstrated this behavior. However, that's what Firem wanted everyone to believe. You see, there is one more thing Firem was known for, and that was his round 100 speedrun on Ascension, which was the first ever sub 6 hour to round 100 on Black Ops 1. 
Because of this, a player named Oscar Otter would track Fire Rim's Thunder Gun trade average, which came out to be a 3.6 average. This, and his recent self-expose of using a stealth patch, was enough for Oscar to call Fire Rim a longtime cheater. Although, there was not a spreadsheet detailing his odds, so I went out of my way to do just that. Similar to all of the Ascension High Round games, I figured out the probability of Fire Rim's Thunder Gun, Gersh, and Doll trade averages before multiplying them to find the overall probability of his game. To say I was dumbfounded is a massive understatement, because when I calculated the odds of Fire Rim's 5 hour 58 Ascension 100 speedrun, it came out to be 0.00000. .00000 5927%, or a 1 in 16 million, 871,000 chance of such a game to occur. What's incredible is Fire Rim was never banned despite admitting to cheating and also having an astronomically lucky game. This caused me to theorize that there is a group of influential players, moderators, and zombie world record admins that effectively insulates players allowing them to have special advantages if insulated. If a non-insulated player was caught cheating or claiming records without footage, game audio, etc., you can expect a more punishing reaction than if an influential player had done the same thing. And this leads me to the next player named Foxoms. Foxoms was a player who potentially wanted to feel the celebration of his achievements but didn't want to put in the effort. The method he used to claim a round 218 Darius game without footage was a montage, writing in the description that it would have been a very fast game if he did not error, which was another fake detail. He supplied the reader with fake trades and times data, missing a sub 6 time to round 100 by just 2 minutes. He also wrote that this game is proof of round 254 being possible on Darius. It was a fate game that poses a new frontier of progress for BO1, which some commenters believed. However, none of these details were widely understood until Kerr first brought the Darius 218 to our attention. Although, it wasn't until December 2021, Foxoms would finally privately admit to cheating, saying he was caught modding on Darius a few months ago, saying he admitted to it, and promised he wouldn't do it again. He would then continue by saying, I have full gameplay on my PC still, I think, unless I deleted it, cause it's 132 gigabytes or some shit. Then how come you didn't upload any footage of the previous records you claim to have reached? If storage is that big of an issue, just immediately upload the footage on YouTube, release it publicly, then delete the footage off your PC. It's not that hard. Then, Foxoms would say, Curve just hates me cause I modded a game on Reese, and now I live in his head rent free. Yeah, he does hate you because you're constantly claiming records that are cheated. Maybe if you actually played these games legitimately, and uploaded the footage, you wouldn't have people constantly on your ass about claiming illegitimate records. What's even more amazing is despite admitting he cheated a Darius game, Foxoms was not banned. Similar to Fire Rim, he's free to post a record and not face any consequences because he's insulated. Unfortunately, this still isn't the end. Starting in 2022, a player named Unpulv, also known as Connor, would grind Ascension and slowly get better. However, in late 2022 to early 2023, Unpulv would progress absurdly fast, getting top 3 speedrun times for almost all the speedrun categories on Ascension. Unsurprisingly, it wasn't long before he got world records in all of the categories, and continued to lower the times. Although, unknown to Unpulv, Oscar and Waffler had a sustained interest in Unpulv's games since at least December 2022. They took note that Unpull frequently covers the top right of the screen using the long outdated ZBC overlay. This is something Fire Rim used to do as well in this famous Ascension Round 100 world record with a 3.6 average from before. The reason why this was suspicious is because of a thing called Game Mod. You see, when you launch a map using game mod, it'll show yellow text at the top right. This is exceptionally important as it shows if a player is potentially running a modified version of the game. Pause for a moment and take in this point. Discoveries are known in private before they are made in public, 
We don't know how long these cheat methods, ranging from somewhat stealth to being fully stealth, were known in private, and by which factions. This is why the top right area of the screen stays important, even though the stealth cheats may have been circulating at that time. Cheaters, once dead set on the goal of cheating, will do the best with what they have. Non-cheaters, however, don't have the same impulses as cheaters, so they can be made aware of cheats without it changing them. That's why the cheats are best shared publicly. Cheating technology is a problem that affects a community, and it can't be solved if the community isn't made aware of it. This caused Waffler to be suspicious, so he would hit up another player named Staris, who was interested in talking about anti-cheat methods. In fact, Starist was developing an anti-cheat. This quickly caused him to develop a lengthy conversation, talking about ways to detect cheaters, mainly discussing patching and the ways it could be detected. This eventually led them to discussing stealth patching. Stealth patching is exactly what it sounds. It's completely stealth. You can have game audio and not worry about sound bugs or additional menu options that appear when using game mod. The only way you can detect a stealth patch is by statistical analysis or an anti-cheat program. Because Staris was one of the select few to have a stealth patch and test it, he thought it'd be a good idea to release it publicly, as it may help people understand how stealth patches work and increase the probability of cheaters being caught. However, Staris was told by Becca, the head of staff for ZWR, to not release a stealth patch going as far as saying the less people that know how to stealth patch, the better. Waffler was a little disappointed by this, saying that making the community aware of cheating methods doesn't turn players into cheaters. Waffler would then send an image with four quadrants to get Star's opinion on how stealth patching currently affects the community and what the response should be. On the top left, it said people are currently stealth patching and players are made aware of it. On the top right, it said people aren't stealth patching and nobody is made aware of it. On the bottom left, it said nobody is stealth patching and people are made aware of it. And on the bottom right, nobody is stealth patching, nobody is made aware of it. Staris would then say it's either the first option or third option, which is top left and bottom left. This shows that despite Staris being told by Becca to not release a stealth patch, he wanted the community to be made aware of it in some way. This resulted in him talking about a video being made about stealth patching, or possibly a way to display the stealth patch without it being downloaded by players. Waffler was actually okay with this, but wanted to be clear that if someone gets access to a stealth patch, Staris should express the importance that an anti-cheat would need to be the norm if we want to have a higher chance of detecting cheaters. After this, Waffler and Staris would continue discussing stealth patches and anti-cheat methods, until Waffler asked Staris if it would be easy to patch drop rates such as max ammos and have it be completely undetected. Staris would then say it'd be easy to do, but most players would be able to tell, so manipulating drop rates probably wouldn't be a good idea. Waffler would then hit back saying, still something I wouldn't put past cheaters. They expect you to not watch more than two rounds of gameplay before clicking off. This is entirely true. This is a case for pretty much all records, including first room records, which was Waffler's first point of interest in cheated games. This caused Waffler to question the legitimacy of Unpulled's round 70 speedrun record on Ascension, as Unpulled got 4 drops and just 1 Gersh, which is absurdly lucky considering these drops came from the power room of Ascension. So, why is that important? Well, the zombies from the right side of the power room do not give you any drops. Instead of 24 zombies giving unpulled drops, it was more like 16 zombies. On top of that, this wasn't a one-off instance. Unpulled was consistently getting incredible drop rates throughout the run. Stars would then say, I was in a call with Unpulled while he played his game. He didn't use any sort of stealth patch or cheat. Waffler immediately knew Staris was bullshitting because Staris was friends with Unpulv. Moreover, Unpulv was incredibly lucky during his game, and well, 
eyewitness testimony tends to not be a reliable source of evidence. Waffler then asked what Stara's favorite flavor of Skittles was, as a joke, showing that he no longer takes Stara seriously, before going back to talking about Unpulv. He would then bring up the ZBC overlay, and how it can cover up the yellow text that shows up while using game mod. Staris would then say you can use an overlay to block the text, and it'd be sus as fuck. Waffler would then ask if there would be a way to remove the yellow text, in which Staris responded, he doesn't know, but you probably could. Staris would then ask why all the videos Waffler is linking is Unpulled speedruns, and then asking if he thinks Unpulled cheated. Waffler said Unpulled is the only player actively using the overlay at the top right. He would then further say, you said it'd be sus, so I have every right to question Unpulled's drop RNG in his 70 speedrun. Waffler would then post the same 4 quadrant image, which Staris responded saying the bottom right seems the most likely, changing his answer to no one is self patching and no one should be made aware. Once again, Waffler knew he was bullshitting, so the conversation ended there. Surprisingly, after this conversation, Waffler managed to get direct access to a stealth patch Staris was talking about. A player by the name of Turbig was a part of a discord with Staris and Unpulv, and also had access to the stealth patch. However, he wanted the stealth patch public, so he gave it a Waffler so he could analyze the code and see how much luckier the patch was compared to the vanilla version of Black Ops 1. This caused him to do his statistical analysis, where he would see how many first boxes he would get after 100 trials, with a patch, and without a patch. If you don't know, getting a first box means getting a Thunder Gun, Ray Gun, and Gersh's, or Dolls out of the first mystery box. It's incredibly difficult to get, but removes fire sales from your drop cycle until the mystery box moves. This can save a significant amount of time for round 70 and 100 speedruns, as the chances of you getting a max ammo is increased. So, when he used the patch, it was no surprise that it increased his luck by a significant amount compared to the vanilla version of the game. In fact, the patch gave him 20 first box setups, whereas the vanilla version of the game only gave him 2 first box setups. This immediately resulted in Waffler making a video titled, It's Bad But Necessary, where he exposes a stealth patch, as well as Unpull for cheating, and Staris for assisting him. To add on top of that, Waffler decided to release the patch publicly, as it was exceptionally important to show players how a stealth patch works. Unfortunately, Waffler never did a statistical analysis on Unpulv's game, so while it was extremely obvious Unpulv cheated, it was important to give him the benefit of the doubt until we had some numbers. Fortunately, another player named Elvives who saw the video decided to analyze Unpulv 70 and 100 speedrun drop luck, and let's just say the numbers were shocking. Based on Elvive's analysis, he figured out the chance of Unpulse drop luck occurring in his game was a minimum 1 in 2 million chance. This confirmed Waffler's suspicions. However, I still wasn't satisfied. You see, Unpulve livestreamed some Ascension restarts, which resulted in him getting the 50 speedrun record the day before Waffler's video. This made me want to analyze his box luck and see if the theories were true. Unfortunately for Unpulv, they were. During the restarts, Unpulv had managed to get 5 Thunder Guns in just 30 box hits, 2 Gersh's in 58 hits, and 4 Ray Guns in just 8 hits. I was then able to find the probability of these averages, which led me to multiplying them. This resulted in a final probability of 1 in 230,422. This was starting to get ridiculous. Not only did Unpulv have insane box luck, but his drop luck was through the roof. Amazingly, this wasn't all the evidence we found. By sheer luck, I had managed to find a video where Unpulv was playing with a completely stealth patch. Back in 2022, Unpulv uploaded a video titled, The Most Legit Game. It's a way to mock the luck he got in his game. So, once again, I did another analysis, which caused me to find out this cheated game was a 1 in 219,513 chance 
which is very similar to the box luck he got during his 50 speedrun restarts. This right here should be enough evidence to convict Unpulv for cheating, but what's even more interesting is Unpulv wasn't the only person who had access to a stealth patch. Zamba also had access to a stealth patch roughly two months after Unpulv's most legit game. While searching through Zamba's highlights on Twitch, I managed to find a stream titled 100 Perfect, in which he used a completely stealth patch. Even though Zamba was transparent about using it, this begs the question, who is making these patches? Why are they being kept private? And for how long? The way it's being treated is a me but not the approach. Influential players decided by themselves that they are responsible enough to know of cheats and never fake a game but everyone else should have to deal with the uncertainty and the accusations that they are cheaters for using Tim, Trap, or Round Timers, or whichever flavor of the month is being used for provoking debate. Not to mention the friends that they insulate, Fire him and Unpulled, have proven to be as irresponsible as one could get with access to the cheats. Perhaps Zamba and others made promises to people they rely on that they wouldn't share it publicly. But Waffler did not want that problem, so he was the first to release a stealth patch to everybody and bring full attention to the issue. So, that means I should be done talking about Unpulv, right? Nope, this surprisingly is nothing compared to some of the stuff he's done. Harassment and Doxing On March 8th, 2023, Unpulv would send messages on Twitter to a player named Bullet Bill Bull, who has autism. Unpulv knew this, so he, for whatever reason, started harassing Bullet Bill Bull by making fun of him for having autism, saying Bullet should take his autism pills, saying he has Down syndrome, saying he should take his retard pills, as well as saying he should quit zombies and quit life. Moreover, he would say that Bullet is not loved and how no one likes him. And lastly, going as far as saying Bullet should die. Unfortunately, this is just a start. A few months later, Unpulv, along with his friend named Xerity, would dox Bullet Bill Bull by posting his full name and his state along with other personal information in Twitch chats, as well as changing their stream titles to Bullet's name and state. This doxing would progress even further when a few more players decided to help Unpulv, most notably Cylinder and Starus, aka Evelyn, by posting Bullet's name and state in Twitch chats. However, they still were not done. Unpulv had managed to find out Bullet's mother's name and her Facebook account. This would further progress into not only Unpulv and his friends posting Bullet's name, but also his mother's full name in Twitch chats, as well as Discord servers. Moreover, Stars would claim to have messaged Bullet's mom on Facebook as a way to embarrass and make fun of Bullet. To add on top of that, Unpulv would impersonate Bullet Bill Bull in a zombie server called Zombies.exe, which is owned by Void Rumble. So, what was the point of Unpulv impersonating Bullet? Well, he wanted to fake screenshots by making it look like Bullet was saying the N-word. Even then, that was still not enough for Unpulv. Despite Bullet Bill Bull telling him to stop harassing and doxing him, Unpulv had managed to find Bullet's Instagram account and messaged him on there. Amazingly, despite it being nearly a year since Unpulv first started harassing Bullet, he still has not stopped. To add on top of that, this isn't the only person Unpulv has harassed. Another player named Mystic, who is disabled, was called retarded by Unpulv. So, has there been any backlash because of Unpulv's actions? Nope. The only person to have ever publicly called out Unpulv for doxing is Mr. Waffler. Taking this point, the blatant cheating and harassment hurts competition and pushes players out of the community. These are serious problems and is rotting the community from within. So, besides Mr. Waffler, how have others dealt with it, such as the moderators of the main record website? Ignoring the problem. Shortly after Waffler's video and LV's analysis of Unpulv's game, I decided it was important to show Becca the evidence. Moreover, I would show her my extended analysis of Unpulv's games, which I found five games that had first box. 
I then asked her if she had already seen Elvive's analysis and if she watched Waffler's video in its entirety. She then responded yes to both of these questions. She would then say she doesn't believe good luck proved someone cheated, further stating that while she does believe Unpulv cheated, she didn't know if it was enough proof to slap him with a convicted cheater title and remove his records. To add on top of that, she said, I'm going to have a chat with people and see what's what though, because I want to make sure if he is outed as a cheater, it's done fairly. Then she would further explain, the reason why I say good luck doesn't prove someone cheated is due to multiple games that have been cheated, but only got caught out for other reasons. For example, probably Shadows of Evil Easter Egg speedrun. He patched the gum cycle, so people had their suspicions that his games were too lucky, but nobody jumped at that because it's not enough proof. The reason he got caught is because he spliced and clearly sent the wrong patch, meaning he was hiding something, which then led to us finding out he patched his luck, so our suspicions were correct. On paper, this is a completely fair point. But then Becca would completely blunder this point by saying, Everyone thought Furret cheated his moon game, his ascension game, because his luck is astronomical, but there's no proof. Um, actually there is a lot of proof. In fact, there is so much proof that it's practically undeniable. Furret is consistently luckier than everyone else by an astronomical amount on almost every occasion. She would then reiterate, saying, I'm a big believer and you can't 100,000% prove someone cheated off of luck alone. Then how come you never banned Firem? He was caught attempting to cheat an Ascension game by modifying his luck, and was forced to admit it. You can't say you don't believe you can prove someone cheated off of luck alone, and then not ban them despite literally admitting to manipulating their odds. That's just called playing favorites. This immediately felt like a lost cause, but I wasn't going to give up. I would then reply to Becca saying, Sure, but statistical probability is a very good indicator on seeing if someone manipulated their RNG. Obviously, it's not definitive proof, but it gets to the point where the question has to be asked. How lucky is too lucky? I've never seen anyone get as lucky as Unpulv. I would then hit back saying, Because at the end of the day, barely anyone is splicing runs, or doing any of the OG stuff. Most cheaters are more than likely using stealth patches, and the only way to catch them is via statistical probability, which is what's happening to Unpulv. This would result into a short talk between each other, until the conversation ended with her saying, all good man, I'll DM you later to talk about the Connor stuff. However, she didn't. So, five days later, I would ask her if she ever looked into it. Well, over two months later, I still have not gotten a single response. This slowly made me suspect Becca and Unpulv were friends with each other, which turned out to be true. On February 2nd, 2024, Becca would admit in the Zomba Discord that she and Connor were friends. This right here explains why Unpulv is still not banned, and also explains why he never faced any backlash for his consequences, because he is insulated. Even though Becca knew Unpulv docks Bullet Bill Bull, as confirmed since she watched Waffler's video in its entirety, she simply did not care. As long as you are friends with Becca and other community members who are close with her, you will face absolutely no consequences. This makes me really question the community's values, if it is one, since it rewards Unpulv and his friends' behavior. Also, how come every record is approved before being extensively reviewed? It makes no sense, and there is absolutely no excuse for it. Because of this, it creates prime conditions for cheating. Moreover, what's the cutoff point for convicting cheaters because they were too lucky? Is it 1 in 1,000? 1 in 100,000? 1 in 1 million? These are questions ZWR has repeatedly decided to avoid while pretending everything is fine. The rate that they make progress in gameplay standards and anti-cheating measures is incredibly slow normally going with whatever their friends believe to be the best. Moreover, they are still afraid to confidently enforce full gameplay for records when the credibility system of trusting everybody based on friendship was showing its cracks in 2014. On the pack of podcast grand finale, you can hear I rack him up stating, I mean, if you don't have an Elgato or PBR at this point in time, like, <laughs> what are you doing? It's fucking 2014. <laughs>
Zombie World Records barely missed the 10 year deadline by starting to remove records without footage in 2022. This is lacking the context that Wings, the owner of ZWR, would sabotage the site from progressing in many ways, but finding instances where admins themselves stress the importance of gameplay and anti-cheat measures are few and far between. The point I'm trying to make is that if we want to catch cheaters, we need to adopt to modern ways of catching cheaters, even if that means it takes a month or two before a game is accepted or denied. So how do we get moderators to do this? Well, you can get them to do an extended analysis of games. And if that doesn't work, then it's time to get new moderators. But there's just one problem. ZWR.GG, the main record website, has done this many different times, and the way the moderators moderate games has never changed. The way ZWR verifies games is based on a quota. They prioritize speed over delicacy. So, not only are the review standards, rules, anti-cheating measures, and installation prime conditions for cheating games, but the quickness of approving games makes it even less likely for cheaters to get caught. At this point, it's time for a new website. Fortunately, there is one being created called Zombies Headquarters. Although, there is once again another problem. Becca founded and owns this new website. I'm sorry, but if the new site is owned by the same people, my expectations will remain low and I'll expect it to be just as corrupt as ZWR. In fact, the zombies competitive scene is so corrupt that moderators have attempted to make biased votes. On March 7th, 2023, Astrox, one of the moderators for ZWR, and also a close friend of Sluya, Becca, and Furret, would create a vote for a Black Ops 2 rule set. Although, despite Astrox saying he attempted to make the vote as clear and easy to understand, it was still really vague. You see, with most votes in Zombies, there's a specific requirement needed to be able to vote on a rule set. However, this description was insanely vague, so much so that even if you played Black Ops 2 and submitted a record, there was still a chance that your vote would not count. This caused Waffler to ask Astrox whose vote counts. Astrox would then reply saying, only the players who got a top 5 game in one of the three categories, specifically no power, high round, or speedruns would have their vote count. So why is this corrupt? Well, it's the fact that Astrox is completely denying hundreds upon hundreds of votes. You see, each map for each category has about 20 minimum submissions. If you only accept the top 5 games for each map, you are denying over 75% of the community from voting. Keep in mind, this number is insanely generous. If we were to be more realistic, Astrox is denying more like 80-90% to of the Black Ops 2 community from being able to vote on their own game. Moreover, Astrox was only accepting submissions from three categories, one of which is a category he plays super often, called No Power. Moreover, the decision for this vote to only be done this way is a result of corruption. It wasn't BO2 players heading the experiment of the voted rules for their game. It was a No Power player, and a Black Ops 1 player. Currently, there's a debate between Black Ops 2 players on whether or not people should vote across maps and challenges, the way Astrox and Furret intended, which their attitude is that their vote should remain. Furthermore, sometimes it's Black Ops 1 players that are the most outraged about the outgoings of maps such as Mob, Origins, and things they don't play. If this doesn't scream corruption, then I'm not sure what will. Now, this vote was fortunately changed after some backlash to allow all players who submitted in these three categories to vote. But this begs the question, if Astrox, one of the moderators for Zombie World Records, originally planned on making a biased vote, were all the other votes made by Becca or his friends biased? It's tough to say. At the end of the day, this is speculation, but the possibility that some votes were purposely not accepted despite them meeting the requirements is very plausible. So is this the end of voting corruption? Nope. Back in 2020, a new way of saving time in Black Ops 1 and Black Ops 2 was found. This was called Fast Ray. This allowed players to shoot the ray gun significantly faster, which dealt an insane amount of damage to zombies in a very quick time. At first, 
players were super excited to utilize this time save, as it could revolutionize maps such as town or farm. However, Fura was super adamant about not allowing it, despite the choice being left up to the community. This caused him to use his influence to change people's opinions to get it banned, which amazingly worked. Not long after Fastery was found, many votes were created, and as time went on, a player's opinion on Fastray came down to which vote they respected more. This caused the players who were for Fastray to call out for it and say he was using his influence to manipulate votes to get Fastray banned. Although, Furret would brush off these claims, saying they were not true. This caused his friends, such as Zamba, to believe him. Hell, as late as 2023, Zamba, who was discussing with Becca about biased votes, would say this. Yeah, well when Fur gave his opinion on fast firing and all the new info dropped, the cunts that wanted to keep it just said it was from his influence that caused people to change their vote. Who's to say some fucking bullshit like that will happen again if I or Fur did it? What Zamba got wrong is that sure, the people wanting to keep it were claiming foul play, but they weren't trying to rig things in their favor. They just wanted a more fair deciding process than what was given. Also, nobody was saying Furret shouldn't be able to convince people, which is a fair competition of influence. They were just upset that Furret included those who agreed with him in the vote and left out those who disagreed. Moreover, Zamba completely forgot that Furret admitted he was trying to reach to people to get Fastray banned while he was playing his Ascension 233 game. This right here is 100% proof that Furret was trying to manipulate a vote to go in his favor. And unfortunately, this probably wasn't the only time he's done this. The absurdity of power goes without saying, if you have the means and motive to override community opinion, you can do so without needing to justify yourself. This is echoed in Zomba's choice of words when discussing rules in a recent stream. Do you ever think we'll get to a point in the Zombies community where we'll all just agree on a set of rules and they won't change? We're getting there. I, th I think we're getting there. We're getting close large enough group can agree on anything it's always it, it's always biased always fucking will be there's always biased cunts in this yeah. fucking community man bo2 they banned auto trap timers bo1 they allowed auto trap timers when was this when, when the fuck was a few this? months back they allowed it for bo1 how the fuck what who who the I, fuck yeah, voted I, I, for this who for, which individual Anyone in my chat, cough up. Who the fuck was it? You're gonna get fucking blasted. I've... Fuck everyone in the chat that <laughs> voted for fucking that trap timer. Gonna have a revote, and this time you're gonna pick the right fucking one. This is all in effort to attempt banning Tim for the fifth time, when the community has repeatedly approved of the tool. After seeing this, it really made me question the legitimacy of some of the votes that were created for Black Ops 1 or Black Ops 2. Because Furret was never transparent that he was trying to reach to people to get Fastray banned, and only admitted it publicly once, who can say what was going on behind the doors? When explaining why certain zombie players are insulated and given privileges, we focus on their level of influence. This is an under-exaggeration. For many players, their level of control goes beyond just a matter of influencing, and more so resembles a form of dictating. It's not about them tipping the scales one way or another. It is their ability to dictate how things must happen, no matter how absurd. When voting experiments were first happening, those with influence said it was too technologically difficult to figure out. When the community showed them to be wrong, the influential players moved towards a new point of conflict about whose vote should count. Those are legitimate questions to be taken seriously. But do note that while others were trying to cooperate, influential players wanted nothing to do with it unless they had full control. So, whose vote should count? The answer is debatable, but whatever the answer is, it should be clear and unbiased, right? It would be fair if players could know exactly what they must do before being owed a buy-in to vote, which affects leaderboards. People with influence have echoed that they aren't just world record holders, saying they are quote-unquote high level. High level sounds like it references a quantifiable metric, but in their sense of the word, it doesn't. In the following screenshot from 2022, Waffler is pressing for some coherency on when players are owed their buy-in, something Fur has historically avoided answering, to which Fur gives criteria that are based on his personal ratings of the player. 
He says it depends on their level of influence, relationship with other players, his perception of the player's skill level, knowledge, and quote-unquote brain. We don't know what he meant by brain. Then, he projects his political views from the real world onto zombies, saying it proves his general sense that people are too dumb to be trusted. He might have the most influence out of any zombies player, which he should be able to use, but the position to dictate was completely self-appointed by him, and he is shown to be irresponsible in filling it. Frankly, it's tough to say if anyone could be in that position without eventually going mad. In every stage of zombies history, there exists a small group that feels emboldened enough to begin dictating. Said group eventually fizzles out and gives rise to the next group, commencing a new set of values, and so on. The problem is that it doesn't take long for that group to realize they are unchecked and start acting in their own self-interest. This is why voting is a constant experiment, sometimes learning from itself through failure and attempt to get players what they want in the fairest manner. In January 2023, Fastray was finally voted on by the Black Ops 1 community at large, not just by quote-unquote high-level players, making it unallowed 9 to 49. Their greatest fear of Fastray being allowed turned out to be of their own making, misusing time and effort along the way by being unclear and choosing to debate non-stop. However, the same structure of power remains. Just because the high-level players approve of a tactic now, it doesn't mean they won't decide against it in the future and leave players out of the voting process based on their level of influence, relationship with other players, perceived skill level, knowledge, and most importantly, brain. And this brings me to my last and final point, lies and more harassment. Because a community has no morals and allows players to get away with anything, I decided to ban a bunch of zombie players in my Twitch chat starting in November of 2023, and one of these players was for it. This caused him to get insanely frustrated because I no longer wanted to talk or interact with him. So, as a way to get back at me, he would start sharing out of context Discord messages to make it look like I steal content going as far as sharing these messages with other players and claiming I plagiarized videos. Because everyone looked up to Furret and never questioned what he was claiming, this caused everyone to automatically assume I steal and plagiarize content. However, what Furret was claiming was not true. While helping me with the Ascension World Record history, he would explain box cycles and how they work. Because I really liked his explanation of box cycles, I would ask if it would be okay if I copied the text he sent me and used it for my video, in which he responded yes. Furret purposely left out this information because he wanted me to look bad, and unfortunately for me, it worked. Furret would then abuse this opportunity to start shit-talking me on his stream and getting everyone against me. Although, it wasn't until December of 2023 when he finally used this to his full potential. While streaming, he would continue claiming I steal content and then continuing by making fun of me because I apparently talk slow and play slow. Maybe I should just put a big fuck corrupts in like the, the biggest, biggest form possible when I'm reaching the last round before reset, you know? Just so he can steal from from people uh, con from people's content and make his own fucking content and then ban people, he literally makes content by talking slow over other people's video. Did you? I mean, he talks slow, he plays slow. What else? After that, he would continue by making fun of my sexuality as well as allowing his viewers to make fun of my sexuality. Imagine being crabs hitting the gym just to get fucked in the ass, like. This would further cause his viewers to claim I'm a zoophile, and also call me malnourished to make fun of my weight. To add on top of that, he would encourage his viewers to put fuck crops all over their streams. Yeah, maybe every world record from now on should put a giant fuck crops just so he doesn't steal content and then ban people, you know? Like every single world record holder should do that now. This immediately resulted in his viewers doing just that putting fuck crops across many different streams, and despite it being two months since he told his viewers to put fuck crops in live streams, 
they still continued to do it. To add on top of that, after he told his viewers to do that, it immediately resulted in some of his viewers creating accounts to make fun of me or harass me. And lastly, Furra said he wanted to falsely copyright claim my videos. Now, whether or not this is a joke is up for debate, but it still needs to be noted as there is a possibility this video or all of my videos do get falsely copyrighted. Unfortunately, this is what happens when you don't like the zombies community's morals and don't want to talk to certain players. You are forced to deal with reputational ruining lies and harassment from everyone because for whatever reason, people are too interested in hearing one side and only one side of the story. So this begs the question, will anything be done about these issues? As much as it hurts to say, probably not. You see, because players face absolutely no consequences for their actions, nothing will change even if there is backlash, and unfortunately, I can't think of any way to change the community for the better. The most I can do is call out these players' actions and behaviors. To put it bluntly, this is the most toxic gaming community I have ever seen, and if nothing changes, it'll remain that way until the end of time. Lastly, if you have time, I encourage you to check out all the analysis I showed in this video. After all, the more comparisons that are made, the more accurate the data. So I'll leave a link to every single spreadsheet as well as every single record that was analyzed. Other than that, thanks for your time and thank you for watching.